Today, this Tech Talk is being sponsored by MEC Mining. Um, so it's a new thing that the committee is doing, just to, to sort of encourage a few extra people to come in and um, have some talks. So um, just a little bit about MEC Mining. So I'm Erin Sweeney and I manage the WA operations for MEC Mining. And we're pretty much a full service mine engineering and geotechnical consultancy. So we do everything from the, the reserves, resources, feasibility studies, all the way through to operational readiness, um, support operations, and right through to closure, final landforms, everything in between. Um, we also do due diligence for mergers and acquisitions. And um, tonight I'm going to introduce you to one of my senior engineers, Luke O'Brien. So Luke's been working um, with uh, a, a few different sites and he's become quite passionate about autonomous haulage and he's um, learnt quite a few things along the way about how to, to design appropriately and he's got his own personal sort of design principles that he's going to share with us um, today. So um, Luke's been in the mining industry for about 12 years now. And um, without further ado, I'll just introduce you to Luke O'Brien. Hello, thank you for uh, having me tonight. I want to thank OzIM for uh, putting this on and then letting me speak tonight. I'd like to thank uh, the Irish Club for giving us a uh, venue for the night. And I'd also like to thank MEC for uh, paying my bills. So. Um, Today I'm going to be talking about autonomous haulage systems. Um, I'm hoping speaking loud enough for everybody in the back there. A little bit higher? Okay, no problem. We can do that. Um, so when I was asked to do this talk, uh, I would sort of my first thought was, I'm doing designs. I draw lines all day. What do you want me to talk about? So it was a bit of a struggle at first, but once I started looking into what I was, you know, what what I did on a daily basis, and I, you know, uh, what I'm doing with my uh, young team members and graduates and things like that. Um, I essentially came up with what we're going to be talking about tonight. So please be mindful that this is targeted towards new designers and graduates in the mine engineering field, um, though there is definitely content in there regards to um, how important decisions by management on, a, on the implementation of AHS and by the um, by the risk assessments that are done by, by management and decision makers can have a dramatic effect on, on how designs that take place. So please enjoy and I shall move on to the agenda. So just going to be a quick introduction to AHS and haulage design principles. Um, I'm going to be looking at design philosophy. So this is what I sort of thought myself, what, what do I um, what do I take on board when I'm doing a design? What can I pass on to, to new designers and, and new graduates when they're thinking about designing? Um, looking at demystifying AHS designs. Looking at haulage design standards, just st straight run of the mill, but I'll be looking at tying that into super elevation and what that means for AHS. Not just AHS, it is definitely relevant to normal regular design but has more of an influence definitely when we're talking about AHS. And then after that, I'll be looking at a technical design session where I've got a couple of videos which I'll just speak through about a, um, I'll, I'll be speaking to a, a Deswick software tonight, I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with that, but this shows the tools that are available, uh, especially in relation to super elevation and, um, and I give away a couple of little trade secrets. So uh, I know that when I deliver this to, to my graduates, I know they were very, very interested in all the little tips and tricks that I gave away. What is AHS? I don't usually like reading the slides, but this one's a very, uh, speaks for itself. The autonomous haulage system is a comprehensive fleet management system for mines that operate autonomous haulage trucks or driverless trucks that conduct mining operations. So when we're talking about AHS, we're talking about the system, but we're not talking about the robot truck itself. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. So what are haulage design principles? So a principle in its essence is the rules. So in this case, the rules a designer must follow to create an effective design. So after a bit of research, there does come down to about three across most design, anything that you look at designing, whether it be houses, roads, all the rest of it. 
though I did add one and that was consultation because especially in the mining industry um, you need to have knowledge about your life of mine um, the scheduling the current designs that are out there that may or may not be fine you know might not actually even be able to find them so um, you need to know everything about your mind to be able to to design and especially with AHS and that should become clear as I move through this um, tie this all together um, so you need to design the haulage network so it's safe and efficient that obviously goes into the consultation process but you know, is it safe? So that's where the design standards come in. Every mine site has them. They do change depending on what's going on in a mine site. But, you know, with AHS there's different rules to there are to regular. Um, and obviously the efficiency. So um, cycle times, it's pretty obvious. We want trucks to go pr into production and get things moving as quickly and efficiently as possible. Planning for future development and keeping the overall cost of construction and maintenance to a minimum. And this is where I'm tying it, try and tie in super elevation into that. Um, and just to put something on there, I think um, that it's implicit that time is a cost and that should be definitely taken into account. So, so what am I trying to get here? Your design is a presentation at the end of the day. So there can be a multiple of ways that you go about designing something. And you can, as they, the old saying goes, there's a hundred ways to skin a cat. So it comes down to a problem of perception. So the way that you might regard something and the way you might go about designing something or the information that you've taken on board about what you're trying to achieve in your design may be completely different to the person that's ticking that box. In fact, they might not even be, they might think it's completely irrelevant, everything that you've thought about going into your mind design. So that is why you need to know your audience. So know your audience, the details, you know, are they a detailed, uh, a detailed oriented uh, supervisor? Do they just want a solution? Um, what's the urgency? Is it strategic? Is it even going to get built? All those sorts of things. So you definitely need to know your audience. Visit the site before designing. It's the first thing I tell any new designer or new graduate that, that comes on board. Get out there, get into the field, go and see it. Speak to operators, speak to your supervisors. There's nothing worse for any design that you do, and for that matter, any future design that you do, if you go out there, or don't go out there, and design a whole road which takes out the power lines, the dewatering system, you would forgot to load a pit and realise there's a pit in the way that you didn't pick up on whatever the case may be or a future pit, nothing makes you look worse than that and you're going to struggle to get any future designs across the line. So again, know your audience, visit your site. Pretty straightforward, use your landform to your advantage. This goes hand in hand with going out and visiting your site. You know, in these days now, we have drones we, you know, which will give us a nice detailed scan and you're looking at it on your screen and you're like, oh yeah, there's a bit of a ridge there. Though so you go out there on site and it's, it's a 100 metre cliff. You know, so you're not going to be able to see that scale unless you physically go out on the site. If you don't have the ability to go out on site, like I don't have the ability, a lot of my design work now, I have to rely on people on the ground, speak to them and um, you know, make it part of the review process. Pretty straightforward, but you'd be surprised at how many times a new designer, give them their the first opportunity to do a design, and they put a whole road nicely carved into the side of a 100 metre cliff that they're going to get the drills and all the rest of it to just be able to you know, put a one million tonne blast into the side of a hill to put that nice little ramp up there because it's nice and short and it's perfect for, for what we're looking at. So always look at minimising your cut and your fill. And I'll tell you right now, in my eight years of designing, I've only recommended one design where I've actually put K 
cut into the design that required drill and blast. Everything else was maybe uh, a little bit of dozer cut, uh, but everything else is pretty much fill. And then again, it's minimising your fill, minimising your cost, minimising your time. Seems straightforward, but just something that for I'd like to share. The difference between providing a solution versus an option. If I go up to a supervisor or uh, a manager and I chuck 10 designs on his desk and go pick one, it, it, it's not giving them what they want. They've, they don't have an idea of what you've done. They don't have any idea of the um, limited knowledge of, of all the stuff that's in there. So provide a solution. If you do need to provide multiple, multiple options, provide multiple solutions. So at the end of the day, you're trying to sell your design. So what I do is, if you do this, then you'll have to do that. Now, when you're doing your, your overall design, instead of having to provide the 10 options and do all the work for all those options, what I like to do is to put those, if you do this and you have to do that, put it into your presentation because it gives the audience, the people that are looking at it, the opportunity to go, okay, well, he's definitely thought about that rather than, oh, can you please have a look at that design? Can you please look at reworking it like that? So it's a good way to not have to do rework. How am I going to build it? Unfortunately, that does take time and experience. However, you do have your resources on the ground. You have other engineers, you have operators. Uh, a lot of the time, some of these designs, you'll have to make stage designs to show how it's actually going to be built. Cost versus time, that's, you know, again, that's knowing your audience. Hey, do we want it, we, we want it quick or do we want to build it properly? And you cite resources. I don't know how many times I've had supervisors, pit bosses in the past where I've had to sell the design that badly that you know, they're giving me hour time limits for how long they're going to give me a dozer. And having to swear on my firstborn son that I guarantee you it's only going to take an hour and a half and, and she'll get done. So again, avoid overcomplicated designs and drilling and blasting because that's where your money makers are. That's what your drills are for, is to make your money, not to build your haul roads. So at the end of the day, if your design sells itself, then it's a fair assumption that it's a decent design. So if you're following all those things, so this is my philosophy. Everyone else has their own philosophy. But at the end of the day, that's how I sort of look at it. If, if I present a design for review, usually I know I have a good design when nobody actually has anything at the end of it because I've answered all the questions in my presentation, my design review. Regular design versus AHS design. What are the differences? I'm glad you asked. So the main things are LV separation. What I've noticed is a change to curved section running widths, which is again ties into super elevation, which I'm leading to, and AHS zones. All three of these things have one thing in common, and that is space, or the lack of. And that is actually the main difference between regular design and AHS design. It's got nothing to do with how I draw. It has everything to do with how much space do I have, because what are we trying to achieve with AHS? We're trying to have limited interaction between vehicles and the haulage trucks. At this stage, there is still how AHS systems work is you literally lock an area into the pit called an AHS zone and you, everything that's inside that is monitored by an onboard computer and your cars and all the vehicles. So everyone, the system knows where everyone is at any time and the only way to get in there is for a gate. So there's no other way to get in there. So to have on a mine site, everything accessible through one entrance and then have everything locked in is where, where the design really is, is where the, 
where the change actually is. So what does this mean for design? So LV separation. This is where I was getting to with management and decisions that they make through risk assessments. Because at the end of the day, we're still not in a, in a completely robot, do everything, no people needed in there. So a risk assessment on, a, on the LV separation is going to mean the difference between having LV separation everywhere, and I'll show some, uh, a picture to demonstrate what that actually means from a, a safety perspective, or allowing limited amount of people into there that are fully trained, no tourists, and they're, you know, they're, they're monitored, they're, uh, they I know from experience that they have particular times where they'll get crews in and out, so they just, uh, at the end they try not to disrupt the production process as, as minimal as possible. So the LV segregation is, is critical in regards to the risk assessment because if you put LV segregation everywhere, again, what does that mean? That means you need to add LV segregation to every single area that you require it, which is space. And some places, there's not a whole lot of it. And also, building it costs money. The other thing I'll mention with the LV separation is some of the systems have a bit of a tolerance between where the trucks actually run and the LV separation. There has to be a bit of room. They can't just be side on side. Some of the systems will cause it to stop. So um, I know that you know, you'll know you edge on the side of caution. So you're adding more width. So again, more space, more constraints. So AHS zones. Your layout of your zones, your future layout of your zones, um, your, your management, all very critical. Not what sort of string colour you're using. Curve section running width. So as you can see there, um, again, more width, more space, more cut and fill, because you're making bigger roads to accommodate the, the trucks and, and giving them that separation between themselves. Um, if you put LV separation, say, into your pit ramp, which is not, which has happened, um, you, you then start looking at your economic viability of your pits by having LV separation. Um, definitely okay with your very, very, very large pits, but in putting that into a tiny, small pit doesn't make much sense. So there has to, you know, and that's what comes down to your risk management and your risk assessments. And in red there, super elevation, which is camber. I probably should have mentioned that in the beginning. You're probably all wondering, what is super elevation? Super elevation is camber. What we have here is a couple of entrances to a couple of pits and nice, straight, easy access up and down with no control with LV separation. Now, if we were to turn that into LV separation, what you see here is now what we've actually created. But, it, but in essence, what the picture is showing is I've got one, two, three pits with a whole road down the middle with accesses to each of those. Now you can just run an LV that can just basically do what it wants and go through the centre. Or if you put LV separation in there and the image shows is that you're actually creating now multiple points of interaction. And that is sometimes, and, and, and from my experience, actually creating risk, creating problems because of the way that you have to interact with them, putting all the standards in place, visibility, uh, just creating more interactions than, than, than what you uh, would have by just being able to run um, down the centre. And then the added cost of building it, maintaining it, LV separation with drainage has always been a big problem in my experience. Um, so they're things to consider and that's where the decision makers uh, definitely have a big impact in what actually happens. I don't want to go too much on design standards. If you've ever worked at a mine site, they've all got their standards about uh, what's going on there. What I would point out though, 
the main difference is running width. That is what's going to change. And the main reason that changes is simply the distance between the passing width increases. Nothing else increases. The drains stay the same, truck widths stay the same, but your passing width changes, and especially on your curved sections. So that brings me to super elevation. So what is super elevation? Well, super elevation is a transverse slope to counteract centrifugal forces. The design factors are speed and your curve radius on how much camber that you have on your curve. The advantage are the increase of the stability of fast moving vehicles when they pass through a horizontal curve. So what's that about? That's about skidding laterally of the trucks and that's why the width is, is increased in your standards because the trucks don't know whether they're on a, you know, whether they start sliding. So by putting, introducing the super elevation, you're actually stopping the tendency for the truck to skid outwards. It also decreases the stress on the foundation. So in the example that I have in the video, uh, you'll see that there, there is a section there that is actually cresting on a, on a pit. Um, and so, again, it's decreasing the stresses on the foundation. The most important thing I find about using the super elevation is it justifies your selection of your speed. So with your curve radius and the speed that you want to travel, um, it allows you to, it, it's, it's a mathematical formula. The mine sites have their standard and I'll go on to that shortly, but it gives you, it gives you the ability to say at this speed and this corner with this radius, we can go this, this, uh, this, um, this speed, which is great for understanding your cycle times and putting that into your schedules. Uh, what it also does is it makes us start thinking about, do we need to put a T intersection in there? If I run the road 100 metres longer, but put that into a curve, instead of bringing the, the truck to a stop at 10 kilometres an hour and making it slow right down and, go and, and, and make that turn, if that's just a little bit longer, but I can get that truck going at 30 k's an hour based on the super elevation that I've used, is that going to increase my, is that going to be more efficient and better for my cycle times? And I'd have to say, yes, it is. So it's something to think about. But again, as I said, most of the problem that we have with AHS is space. If you can see that, that's a bus on a curve. <coughs> Um, in uh, the testing track, the Mercedes testing track in Germany. So what do the standards look like on, on site? So as a designer, this is what you'll be looking at. What this shows is the percentage gradient that you need dependent on the turn radius from your centre line and the speed that you can attain. Essentially, we don't want to go over 5%. And depending on the tighter the curve, usually the tighter, the, uh, the higher grade that you need. But in general, 5% is the maximum that you'll be using. Um, and all the rest are for, for your larger turn radiuses. And this is what you would use when you're presenting your design. So you can say, this is the speed that we can maintain. This is why I've done the design, instead of using a T intersection or whatnot, um, so that we can incorporate that into the schedule. So what we've got here, what we've been tasked with is that we have a, a curved section of road that we need to increase the width of, the running width of, to be able to um, be able to drive the trucks through there. Uh, as we rotate through this view, you'll see that it's not really convenient to be able to just take out a hill and come straight through the middle of it. Uh, so that gives you an indication of what we're dealing with here. For the benefit of everyone here, um, you know, I've got very, very narrow sections uh, with, with a valley, um, with two hills in the way. There's no way to get around uh, just drilling and blasting and making this road straight. Uh, so where, did I, where do we start? So we look at wherever possible visiting the site as, as discussed, um, site contacts and all the rest of it. Um, 
in this case, my site contact was um, didn't want to deal with it. They put a nice red box about it and said that this needed to be looked at. So that was my site contact. Very well done. Um, what constraints did I had? Uh, I had a big, massive hill in front of me, uh, and I couldn't get rid of it. So I had to stick with the alignment that we had. Did I know my standards? Yes, I did. They were provided to me by the, uh, the company that uh, employed me. Didn't have to do much with layers and infrastructure. It was very well set out. Um, and understanding the traffic management, it was a very major, it was a major fire up there. We, you couldn't mine without it. Um, and uh, probably just a little bit more background. Uh, this was an implementation of AHS. So we had to bring this up to the AHS standards to be able to, to do it. Uh, and know your audience. So yes, I did know my audience. Um, they wanted me to fix it. The way that uh, this, this system is working is you're actually finding a center line. So, but drawing the center line is, is the actual issue, not the actual drawing of the string. So all of it actually comes, is automatically outputted once you've got your center line in the right position. And that's actually the, the hard part, is drawing the one string. The other thing is, is that you can only put super elevation in one direction. So in this case here, I had to break this down into three sections to be able to get uh, my super elevation moving um, uh, in, in, the, in the right directions on those curves. And then I had a nice straight section where I just put a cross section across the view. What I'm doing here is I'm, uh, this is how I'm actually finding my center line. So by uh, looking at, um, By, by looking at the contours and, and starting at my minimum, uh, at my my minimum width, so the area that needs the most help to get it up to the, to the width, to minimise the the backfill, um, I start basically looking at contours, looking at where my line needs to start, and I start to develop the inside radius of my super uh, for, for my road segment. From here, you'll see that the line that I, the, the arc that I've actually drawn around that corner, it isn't a straight line. Um, you can manipulate in this software to, to get the right gradients as it comes along. So what you'll see here is actually that curve that comes around actually goes up before it starts coming down. So now that I've got that, I'm now able to utilize the, 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 the road building tool and what I've done here is I'm actually building the road to the midway point so that I'm getting, I'm basically making, getting this to create the center line for me. So this part I can tell you right now, graduates absolutely loved it and stole all my ideas and now I'm out of a job. Anyways, what this does is it actually creates, it can create your cut and your fill solids, it creates your cut and fill uh, polygons, it creates your road outline, and uh, in this case, I've actually used the road outline to find my center line, to actually draw the center line. And then all I'm doing then after is using that as the center line, running it back through the pit tool, which then gives me the full road. And then I can start looking at it iteratively uh, to see whether um, whether I've minimised the cut and fill as, as I wanted to. So on this one here, you can sort of see um, I've done half the road width. I've now got a centre line string that I can now copy for my next section. Okay, so now that we've got, on there you can see I've, I've created a, a solid, I've created an outline string. Um, you, can, you can see it's automatically updated the whole surface uh, with that section of road done, but it's only half, halfway there. So in the next one now you can see I've, I've made a, a new string. So one single string is all I needed, just in the right place. 
run the pit tool again, and this is in real time too. Uh, it's actually running. I think it's sinking. There we go. Okay, so I'm running the pit tool again, single string, and that will provide me with now the complete road outline, the cut and fill solids. You can see here we're just selecting it. Goes through its wizard. Put in the requirements in there for the uh, the slope of the gradient, the direction that I want it, the road widths. There's the output layers. This will give me everything in one single sweep. Press OK. As a bit of a think, and when I turn everything back on, ta-da! Got a road, and uh, if I just um, turn that sideways, you'll start seeing uh, perfectly. I've put that in there to minimise cut and fill. And then from there, it's just a matter of putting in your windrows, doing your, all your separate sections, putting them together, and when you're done, you start looking at a design that looks like this, a complete design. Uh, as you can see, two, two major cambers in there and, and a straight section uh, with the crossfall. Um, looking on the side view, uh, we spoke a little bit before about the um, the if you can really see on there you can see on on that there you can see the edge of the pit and we spoke about stability of of the slope from having the camber in there so you're putting um, um, uh, less stress on that so when you when you're talking to that to your geotechs you're showing them that you know your, your, uh, your inter-ramp angles and, um, and how stable it's going to be. So you're using the super elevation to justify your stability of, of putting that construction there. And there's just another bit there. You can see I've um, minimised that cut and fill as much as I possibly could, sneaking it in there. And then for something pretty, you can show the the drainage of your design through the colour elevation, you can see how the, the drainage is going to work and, and that's um, going to lead to helping your uh, future costs in maintenance and, and things like that. So um, I really do apologise everybody for, for, for the quality of the projector tonight. Um, I do um, insist that you go home and do some homework and watch those videos. Um, I hope that they do provide um, uh, a reasonable representation of what's actually achievable just from a single line but obviously the secret is to get that line in the right spot so that's the hard part um, but the output uh, speaks for itself so um, yeah that's that's pretty much me is there any questions hi it's it's interesting that iron ore has really driven the aut uh, automation but I kept thinking, I was talking to my friend beside me, that if we've got a half a K deep pit and you're saying that the trucks aren't very good with slip um, or skidding and things like that, I was almost thinking a half a K, God, you know, if the ramp these days is probably going to cost you 100 million, 120 to get it down to the bottom, then you'd be, you really would nice to have the decrease of separation distance and the, the overall pavement width. Yep. assuming geotechnically okay and what you're saying is on curves because of the characteristic of the automation and without the operator that you're increasing the width on curves 
So you, what you're positing is that possibly you won't get the advantage of a really deep pit where your ramp costs an, an obscene amount of money. Yeah, so great question. And, um, and I've attended quite a few AHS related talks in my time uh, and, and I've always asked the question, um, I, I got lucky that I started on at, at an AHS pit at the beginning of my career and um, not much has changed in regards to the, uh, the widths of roads, though there's always been talk that, 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 they, uh, that they, as the technology grows that they will become smaller, uh, smaller and smaller and smaller. Unfortunately, from, from all of the discussions that I've had going to these meetings, there's no output from the supplier to say, listen guys, stop doing your roads at 50 metres wide, go and do them at 38 as they used to be done. But there's no, there's no, there is no process in that. So that process is driven by the mine sites themselves and how much risk that they want to take in regards to the standards that they're using to uh, do that. And obviously in a safety driven world, we're edging on the side of caution, uh, the side you know, of safety to be able to, um, you know, how, how, how that's driven. So, so to answer your question, the problem is, and, and this is what I, I was sort of leading on to in regards to risk management, is how important perception is to the risk management and how much effect it can have on your design. Um, so, you know, there's a big difference between having a you know, a, a 40 metre road, which you can, you know, 40, 41 metre type road that you can have with an AHS and uh, putting an LV separation on there and getting it out to the realms of 60 plus metres, massive difference. Um, not saying that's, that's what's happening, but there is potential for that, um, dependent on, you know, a, a manager coming in and saying, I'm not happy with that risk. So that's why it is important for us to understand um, the consequences of, of the AHS design and its process and the risk management. And then for your designers to know, this is why I'm designing it, how I'm designing it, and then can communicate that on. So that's why the super elevation gives you. I, I honestly did go looking to try and find some sort of empirical costs in relation to how much tire saving and, and all that, that having the super elevation did. Um, I, I couldn't find any numbers. Um, but what I did notice was that it was it gave justification for how fast you can have your trucks going in there. There there is um, math behind it, so there is formula. You can delve into it, and you can use that as as uh, as, as science to to use. So I'm a bit out of date with AHS because I'm retired, but I was involved in Rio's first trial, and Komatsu laid down some fairly strict road design and I can't remember what the numbers are now but there was a bit to the side that you call the drain there was the truck width plus tolerance there was a separation then there was the other side of the road and we were we were in a trial situation so everybody was trained vehicle interaction was light vehicle interaction was minimized or man vehicle action was minimized um, I don't think the system allowed for super elevation. It was, this is the curve radius, this is the maximum speed the truck can do. Over and above that, there was dry conditions, wet conditions. So you could put a 50% cut in speed or whatever the number was, because it's raining today. I'm sort of four years out of date, so I don't know whether those things have changed or whether now they've got an allowance for super, eleva super elevation built into the thing that you in can, can increase your speed on a certain corner because you've now specified that it's got super elevation or not. Yeah. So uh, the one thing I have noticed, the difference between reading old standards from back, back in the day to, to now, is essentially the word required in super elevation um, when it comes to AHS systems. So um, to me that to me, that rang out to, to do something about it. Obviously, when it comes to iron ore and, and the big companies, everything's GPS, you know, the graders, the dozers, and when they build it. Um, so they have a lot more capability of being able to build those in. Um, it is included in, in those big companies' standards now. 
Um, though I've had no interaction in regards to building those standards, uh, I just follow them. Yeah, I, I could imagine you'd put it in because it hopefully reduces tyre wear if nothing else. Yeah. Um, I guess the, but the, I, I, I don't know that it changes widths. I can't remember that we changed road width on for corners and that sort of stuff. Yeah, so that, that's something, and that's why I sort of put it in there. That's that's the note. Of, that's the thing I've noticed. Uh, so gone are the days of basically drawing, uh, you know, drawing a line and then just offsetting it, um, as as what we've I mean, done we, in the past. So. For the trials, at least, we we just basically stuck to back then Komatsu standard, mm. and and we didn't have. uninformed managers and superintendents imposing their safety perceptions on top of that. Mm. I was the quarry manager for the first one, so I, I just accepted what they said. Yep. This, is, this is safe, this will do. Yep. Um, if, if you want to expand that, then you, then you should be justifying it, not just doing it. Yeah, and that's what this was about, yeah. I think he stole it off you. Yeah. Okay. Um, just one quick question. Yeah. You've sort of run through designs. So I guess super elevation is something that people should consider whether it's AHS or not. So that should be the basic design criteria you put in. What rule of thumbs, though, are you applying at the moment for autonomous haul systems for road widths on flats or road widths on curbs? Do you have a rule of thumb that you apply? Uh, you're saying, like, in general? Oh, yeah, I, I don't want to get into that because that's that's really a site by site basis, and I don't want to. Um, yeah, e every site will have their own standards for what they're using. Um, it's not something that I really get into to say somebody does this or somebody does that. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, I can't answer that any more fully for you. But but in in regards to the super elevation, what I put up there tonight is pretty standard in regards to a minimum of five percent on a super elevation grade. Uh, because that's that's not a um, super elevations themselves are based on um, on actual formula in the background. So about your your, your um, the, the types of trucks and stuff that you're using. Um, obviously, again, I haven't had any input into that. Just looking in the background, looking at the maths that's involved. That's not a number that's just pulled out of a rule of thumb. That's actually scientific that they've come up with that standard. Yeah, yeah I, I accept that. Yep. And that, yeah, quasi super elevation is something that we should do for all our haul road designs, full stop. Yes. Okay, whether it's autonomous haulage or not. But when you're designing a curve and you're going to fit, say, a two, 220 tonne haul truck into that curve, mm -hmm. what minimum width would you apply? Or do you have a minimum width or a factor that, you know, truck width or whatever else that you apply to a curve? Th there is, but again, like I said, it's it's based on a site by site basis, and I, I can't get into that because um, that that's that's obviously something that those companies have spent a lot of money on to to find what they you know to to do that that investigation in the background. I apologise. Luke, uh, that was very refreshing to hear somebody bring up super elevation because. Some of the very largest autonomous mines in the world have been designed with beautiful haul roads. All of them, as you say, extremely wide. I mean, it's, uh, I, I take it it's conservatism with the industry for safety reasons to start with. But some of them with zero super elevation. And these are mines that are pushing productivity. So they're pushing their truck speeds to the limits. And it's far more than tyre wear, I can assure you. It's uh, the tyres, these large tyres, because they're typically uh, 240 up to ultra class running on autonomous, uh, they can't handle um, lateral acceleration. And uh, without super elevation, you're getting uh, tyre failures prematurely. It's, and in fact, it is the tyres that are limiting the productivity of autonomous haul trucks. And super elevation is the most critical issue, without a doubt. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's really refreshing to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And, and just to uh, maybe elaborate on that, when I was doing the presentation, part of the reason I was sort of put that little bit about know your audience in there is there unfortunately is still a lot of people out there that they don't, they don't want the fancy design, they just want the road. Just tell me where to put it. 
the grader and the you know the grader and the dozer will fix up the elevation um, when they do it. So uh, again, this is definitely uh, when I did this was targeted towards new designers and uh, and graduates, so that they when they're doing a design, if they've got this sort of information, they can use that to now justify in their designs what they're doing, rather than just being you know. If, if the manager turns around and says, you know what, I, I don't really care about that, that, that's part of knowing your audience, unfortunately. Okay, um, we, have, we have Australia's leading tyre expert in the room here tonight, Tony Cutler. So, Tony, would you like to say a few words about what you've heard tonight? Tony, I thought the, the early learnings I thought from the aut, uh, autonomous trials was that you almost need thicker sidewalls because everybody wants to go faster around the um, corners. Do you know if that's been reflected in tyre design? No, it's not the sidewalls, it's, um, it's the shoulder areas of the tyre, but... Oh, so it's shoulder. Oh, yes, the shoulder, but... Yeah. And the two major manufacturers have both made big inroads. Uh, one of them by designing a larger tyre, yep. larger tyre size, and the other by just um, increasing the strength of the casing. But it all comes down to the super elevation in the end. You have to design for an autonomous mine site. Every curve should be specifically designed to a speed, um, curve radius, and um, super elevation. Every single one. So you sh it, it's not universal. You you do it by because it is absolutely so critical. And as Roger said, every, every mine should have super elevation. It's always a problem on any mine, whether it's manned or autonomous. But on, super eleva on autonomous mine sites, it is absolutely critical if you want to get your maximum productivity. Because you're going faster than the human operator. That's exactly right. And as Jeff said, I mean, the original Hammersley Iron situation, I think uh, everybody was so concerned about safety that there was, uh, I mean, I saw some of the truck speeds on the original uh, uh, mine sites and they were quite low. I think everybody was very concerned about doing everything properly and conservatively. But right now we've got mines pushing the absolute limits on these trucks, both in terms of payload, target payload, and in terms of maximum speed. Yeah, And it's maximum speed that kills tyres, not average speed. Yeah. Just a um, question before, you know, when you're um, talking to, to junior engineers about the design principles early at the start there, um, just how do you talk to about value? Like, you've spoken about minimising cut and fill. Yep. Right? But particularly in, I guess, the big end of town, um, with autonomous haulage systems, you're going to run millions, hundreds of, a lot of, a lot of dirt down that road over the life of that road. Um, the, the cheapest road isn't necessarily the best value road there. So, I mean, how, how do you educate and, you know, try and present a value proposition um, there when, and, and when you're designing um, in that context? Yeah, and I think I, I sort of went over that. I, I, I personally will go overboard with my design presentation, uh, give, uh, like in, in this case here, you know, every presentation I'll, I'll point out the super elevation what it is, uh, the standards that that company has. So I put it there. So just increasing the the awareness of it, um, and you know, having that extra. Um, uh, I treat every single design as a as something that I'm trying to sell to somebody. I've had um, most of my junior engineering career. Um, I've had old school pit bosses and I've had to, you know, I've had to make it be their idea. Uh, that, that's how far a level you have to go to sell some of these designs. Um, so the more, it's not really about more information than just the correct information. I, I keep on going on about it. Knowing your audience, what do they actually want, care about? What do they want to know? Um, and incorporating that into your delivery uh, of, of your designs. I mean, designing a haul road in, in essence is fairly straightforward, especially with the tools that we have nowadays. Um, 
but putting in that, like you said, the, the value of um, being iterative and, and more concise in what you're trying to deliver, um, providing them with um, anything that that helps to give that, that message. Um, I have worked in civil, so there, there is a definite big step between um, the material used, subgrades and all the rest of that. We don't go into any of that. A lot of that gets done well prior towards uh, a mine engineer like myself coming along. Um, we're in the, in the first contracting stages for your major, major haul roads, but it should be something that should be um, looked at for, for something that's going to be there for a very long time. Um, look, thank you. Look, actually, you've, uh, it's been fascinating the insight that was almost counterintuitive, as I said before, that you're, you're wanting wider widths on curves and the organisational uh, processes are still sticking to that, you know, what, three times or three and a half, what are the truck width. The, the interesting thing I'm, I've been hearing is that the, because of the absence of people in the, in the hall routes, that they're forgetting about basics like uh, pavement density which is watering, are you hearing any of that sort of antidotal stuff that they, they're just not maintaining pavements because you don't have the trucky bitching to the water cart operator that the pavement's falling apart and it's dusty? Are you with... Uh, in, in previous lives when I've been on site, definitely. Um, in regards to uh, where I'm sort of working at the moment, really concentrating on, on the design and the output and, and more about strategy. Uh, which is sort of what I touched on a little bit with um, AHS. It's not just about building one haul road, it's about how it interconnects with, for, for the mine for the rest of its life and, um, and how best to utilise, you know, because you're going to have uh, interaction between um, interaction points where you'll have uh, AHS and, and um, like I say, on ROMs, for example, one side of the ROMs going to be autonomous and one side's going to be manned still. Um, so those are the things that are probably more uh, things that I'm thinking about. In regards to that sort of stuff, um, I'd be very surprised to hear that there isn't um, standards and that for all of that stuff that, that's outlaid. Whether it gets done or not, that's completely up to site. 